Welcome to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Markle. I'm a curriculum development specialist here at NCBRT, and I work in collaboration with subject matter experts to create valuable and timely training for the responder community. The National Center for Biomedical Research and Training provides mobile training to both the national and international emergency response community. Today on the podcast, we're talking to Brenda Dietzman, Shannon Paulson, Maggie Varela, and Kristen Zeman about mentorship and leadership. Thank you to Brenda, Shannon, Maggie, and Kristen for coming on the podcast and sharing with us today. So earlier, we talked a little bit about leadership and women's role in leadership. Um, So when pursuing these leadership roles, do you think that women have gotten a fair chance at, you know, landing these higher level positions? I don't think so. <laughs> let, me, let me be the elephant in the room, I guess. <laughs> um, I think that they're now, in today's world, I think they're getting more opportunities. And I think, as Shannon said, there was a time um, that they were kind of forced to give women more opportunities so that the department could look like it's like it was a, you know, advanced forward thinking department. But I don't think that we have the same opportunities, at least not when I was uh, moving up. Now we have some amazing women and and I had the opportunity to do it. So I really can't complain. However, even in my opportunities, um, I saw that uh, if it was another uh, man that had less experience than me, but was that good old boy or had a click uh, with the person that was in charge, even if I had more experience and more knowledge in, in that realm, that individual got got the position. Uh, and I saw that happening a couple of times, even though, like I said, I can't complain because I also had opportunities to move up. And the one thing that I saw as well is that when a woman did get an opportunity, to me, it was kind of sad to see that. It was like everybody, oh, no, it's just because, you know, she must have done something to earn that. It's like, no, <laughs> you know, why can't that woman, why is it that when a man got a position, it was because of the hard work and experience that he had had. When a woman gets a sought after position, but she must have done something uh, to get to that to that position. That was the part that I found sad, and I think now it's it's evolved and changed, and now women are seeing, you know, their their reputation kind of follows them in a positive light. Um, and then when they are in those bigger positions, they see as they are deserving of it. But unfortunately, at least when I first started, it, any woman that was in a higher ranking, basically, they must have done something to earn it, <laughs> something else other than police work. By and large, absolutely not. People, women do not get a, a fair shot. And and the reason for that is because people, men promote in their own image. And, you know, in it's it's not necessarily something that's done intentionally, but I'll give you a great example because a, a commander uh, called me in the office. I was up for a position. I was a sergeant up against another sergeant. And he looked at me and he said, wow, your credentials are fantastic. He said, but I got to tell you, I'm going to give it to to the other guy. And I kind of looked at him and he said, listen, he's like, I know him. He comes to barbecues at my house. First of all, what an idiot to say this to me. Um, But he he genuinely said that. And I sat there dumbfounded and I said, let me get this straight. You know, I I said, I'm not invited to barbecues at your house, but perhaps if I were, you know, you would enjoy my company and learn to trust me as well. But he used the word, I trust him because I know him outside of work. We're not given those kind of opportunities. And, you know, and I used to, when I walked out of that office, I thought, wow, you know, he was really honest with me. That's pretty cool. You know, but as I was thinking how unfair that is, because we we truly do it. So, you know, we hang out with people and we promote our own likeness. And so um, it has to be intentional. And so I have been the product of really great progressive men who have thought we need to bring kind of what we were talking about earlier, Maggie, bringing people to the table. I want, I, you think differently than me, so I need to bring you in. But that's a conscious choice. That is a conscious and, and, and direct and pointed effort to do that. Um, and most of the time, again, maybe not so much by intention, but we just, we pick people, you know, who think like us and who look like us because it's just more comfortable that way to have that. So I think that is why we have a disadvantage being the 12% of the workforce, period. Yeah. And I, I think we're still, you know, the, the, as much as we're, we're gradually getting away from it, let's be honest, the good old boy system is still alive and well, uh, in the United States, um, you know, in leadership, in politics, 
um, you know, and, and in in institutions and professions, uh, you know, and and law enforcement is very definitely a a, a symptom of that. I, I think perhaps with optimism that we are very close. I think we're in kind of that last generation um, uh, of hierarchy. I think as we see the turnover in leadership, uh, especially in our larger departments uh, over the next few years, um, that we might kind of see the, the death of that to a large degree, um, I think. Uh, so, um, you know, but but I've had some 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 situations and some experiences, you know, similar to Kristen, where it was kind of shocking that they were willing to, to say the things that they said and admit the motivations that, that they admitted to me. Um, you know, I, I can remember being a sergeant um, at a review board for a, for a kind of a debrief on a tactical scenario where I was the supervisor at scene of a, of a quite hellacious, highly televised um, lengthy police pursuit with an application at force at the uh, force at the end, and you know, with the deputy chief at the time doing the debrief, um, and, and me advising essentially of the planning and orders that I gave as the supervisor of record in the course of this, he expressed disbelief that I could have done that planning and given those orders, and that my male officers would have followed them. And he was steadfast in his belief that the officers must have kind of made this up on the fly. Um, you know, it's and quite frankly, um, I can remember in my first year as a captain, um, you know, a, a an, I will just say an individual several ranks above me um, when evaluating me to someone else made a reference to me being cocky. Um, and I, I have very firm beliefs that had I been male, that would have never come into the characterization. Um, I, I would have just been seen as another assertive, competent male commanding officer. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, I, I, but I do, I, I'm, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I think we are, are very close to, to having a, a very serious sea change um, in, in law enforcement here, uh, as we, you know, as, as those that that kind of male hierarchical power structure holds on with every fiber of their being, you know, to those last vestiges of power, um, it, it's it's that close. I couldn't agree more. I I I, I have great hope, in in a, my. Millennial and Gen Z, Gen Z friends, I, I really, really do. Um, you know, I think a lot of this does come back to, uh, you know, we can look at the profession as a whole, but I think that we can also look at organizations. Uh, my organization here in the Midwest, right, uh, Bible Belt, um, very progressive. Uh, I was promoted under four different sheriffs, under four different administrations, and they all expressed uh, great glee that they could do that, um, and and was literally asked by supervision, very high up supervision, if not the sheriff himself, um, to test, even though I didn't want to, uh, because they wanted to promote me. So I think I think a lot of it does now within the organization. Of course, there were those people who weren't quite up to speed on that. But um, I, I really think that there are a lot of great progressive organizations out there that don't always practice it, but it's because they have those um, areas of their organization or people within their organization, it still holds those old fashioned beliefs. But I think that there are some great organizations out there that truly do um, understand the importance and the value of promoting diversity. How have you combated um, imposter syndrome when pursuing promotions? Or how do you recommend someone to, um, to kind of push against those feelings that we often get? Sometimes I, I, I think that we are our own worst enemies and that, you know, and I don't, I, I do know that this is, you know, unique to females and, 
uh, but I'll speak to myself, uh, to, to, to my own personal experiences that I always felt like I had to check all the boxes before I pursued something. You know, I needed to get the master's degree, the second master's degree, you know, go to the FBI Academy and all of the things. And I would look over at my male counterparts, you know, who are like, oh yeah, I'm going to take that promotional test. I mean, it didn't matter whether they spoke in complete sentences or not. They are so confident. Um, and, and I was harder on myself, I think, than other people were on me. But the answer is, is it's the voice inside your head. It's you. And I remember having this moment as a female sergeant um, deciding, am I going to put in for this position of a lieutenant that has never you know, been afforded to a female? And I started talking myself out of it. No, I don't have this. I don't have that tactical trajectory that I need. I don't have, you know, that operational, you know, SWAT. Um, so, and I just kept talking myself out of it. And then finally, in, in the middle of my own thought, uh, as far as going, no, why me? I thought, wait a minute, why not me? And that goes to what we were saying earlier is that, you know, I look around me and I see examples of the, the males that are going to pursue this promotion. And I thought, oh man, if they can do it, I can do it. So I think that that this is where women have to take our own um, careers into our own hands. And we can't let either our voice, which actually happens to be the loudest inside our head, uh, deter us. Um, and, and with that, we certainly can't let other voices. And I remember in that moment, when I made the decision, I'm going to take this test. I had signed up for the promotional test that morning. I got called into my commander's office. Um, in my career, I have had great mentors. I have also had great tormentors. And this guy called me into his office and he told me, he kind of chewed, you know, chewed me a little bit about some evaluations. And at the end of our conversation, he looked at me and he said, you taken the lieutenant's test? And I said, yes, actually, I just signed up. And he said, if I can help it, you will never become a lieutenant in this police department. And uh, I remember feeling, you know, like my eyes start to well up and I thought, oh, hell no, there is no crying in police work. And so I got in my car and I went into the ugly cry and I let his voice it would truly overpower mine. And then I got home and then I thought, I'm not going to let him do that to me. So not only did I read all of the books, but uh, I read them again. And every time I got tired of reading them, his face just like, you know, showed itself in my head. And I thought, I'm going to read them again. And then I dictated them onto, you know, a little tape recorder and I listened to it in the shower. And I became the first female lieutenant because I, I really believe that when you learn to use criticism as fuel, you will never run out of energy. But honestly, I think that imposter syndrome is alive and well, and it's up to us to overcome it. Kristen, please tell me that you ended up supervising him. Without without a reveal, <laughs> the, day that I, the day that I moved in to the office next to his as a commander, and then the day that I beat him out as chief was uh, kind of a cool a cool day. So you know, there <laughs> there, there is uh, there is retribution. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's it's literally competing against one person, it, it, it <laughs> yourself. You know, I mean, and that's just it. I never thought of myself as competition. He looked at me as competition later, you know, every, you're fine until someone sees you as a threat. Right. You know, but I think that's the way you overcome it is just competing against one person. I, I literally had a, a male sergeant pat me on the head one time uh, when I was like in my first year in law enforcement, because I'd done a good job and, and I ended up being his supervisor. So, <laughs> and you know what? I was fair and all that. Right. Because ethics, but yeah. So, you know, imposter syndrome to me was huge. I suffered from that horribly. I had not heard of that phrase until about seven, eight, nine years ago now. Um, and I read it in a book and I, when I read those two words, I instantly, right. Had this vis visceral reaction of what it meant. And I was like, oh my goodness. I called a friend of mine and I was like, she was high ranking in another organization. And I said, do you ever feel like you don't belong where you're at? Like you're not qualified good enough. And she, there was this dead silence. And then she goes, who have you been talking to? And I said, no, nobody. I'm just asking you if you ever feel this way. And she's like, no, seriously. Was it, was it my chief? It was my chief, wasn't it? 
I was like, no, 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 my friend. And I, and I told her then before she had a complete panic attack. Um, and it was so interesting because literally both of us overnight, right. The change was instantaneous because we understood where it was coming from. And, and it, and it comes from implicit bias that both men and women have against women. Right. And there's a whole reason behind that, a whole bunch of reasons behind that. But you know, that inner critic, that, that voice inside of our head, what we have to understand that that inner critic, which is that really loud thing in our voice, in our head that just criticizes you're not good enough and, and feeds into that imposter syndrome is our own voice normally. Um, if you think about it, it's your own voice. So how do you tame that? And, and you know, therapists, psychologists have a very easy way of doing it. It's called name it to tame it. So you take that voice and you put a name to it. My inner critic's name is Tiny. And when Tiny's chipping his teeth, you know, you're not good enough. You're, you're too ugly. You're too, too this, too this, not enough this. I just, Tiny, take a hike. And then what is left is that voice, my voice, right? That coach, that, that encourager, the, the what I am, what we are to everyone else, right? That's the voice that is left. And, and I think that women really have to get inside of that because if you think about it, you know, we get up in the morning, we look in the mirror and go, oh, I'm too fat, I'm too this, I'm too ugly, the lines, the I, I don't have enough degrees yet, I, I, I can't take care of my kids and do a full-time job, I, I'm not good enough, right? We, we say that to ourselves all the time. But if you think about if your best friend said that to you more than, say, once or twice, how long would that person be your best friend? probably not very long. We have to learn to become our own best friends and our own best co coaches because you're right. That voice is the loudest thing in our head. Brenda, I agree with both of you actually wholeheartedly. Uh, I mean, I consider myself and people tell me that I'm the most like motivational person that I know. And people tell me, oh my God, I, I'm so glad that you helped me get through this and you helped me. And I try to motivate people, try to encourage people and I, especially in law enforcement, um, both men and women, because I've had, you know, young men, young officers that have worked for me and they're looking to, you know, grow in their career. And they've come to me and I'm all like, I'm the biggest cheerleader. Yes, you can do it. Do this, do this, do this. And then when it comes to me, I agree. I beat myself up all the time. as like, oh, you know, I really don't know if I can really handle that. Can I really do this? Can I, you know, and then I end up doing it. And I'm still like, well, I could have probably done, could have done that better. You know, I should have done this. I could have done that. I could have. So you're right. It is our, our voice that kind of defeats us until you come to a point that you're like, no, you know, and, and sometimes I have to thank several people that have helped me to not defeat myself because not only have they have confidence in me that I didn't have in myself. Um, and then they've put me out in that, uh, out of my comfort zone Right. And I've been able to then prove to myself and to others that, hey, I not only can I do this, but I can do it well. And then there's also been those critics, as you guys have all experienced, <laughs> you know, those people that that you see are getting promoted and are putting in for positions that it's like this person, not only do they have no business getting promoted, they have no business being in police work, <laughs> you know, and if they can do it. Definitely. I can do it. I remember my first promotional exam. I studied, uh, I was a group of, of officers that all studied for the sergeant's exam, male and female. We had like a four or five uh, group person. And I was like so nervous and I studied, basically I lived, eat, ate and breathed that SOPs, right? <laughs> Trying to study. We took the test. I remember one of the gentlemen that I knew, he's like, oh man, I aced this. I did an amazing job. I mean, I mean I'm going to come out number one on the list because we ranked by how well you did on the interview, how well you did on the interactive and how you did on the testing, right? And I'm like, oh my God, I left there defeated thinking, oh my God, I'm not even going to make the list. I did horribly. I can't believe that I probably missed this. You know, so it was really bad for me and for him and all the males, like you were saying, all the males were like, oh no, I did great. I aced this. So the list comes out two weeks later, okay? I came out number five, number five of 335 people that took the test. And I'm like, no, I can't. I still didn't believe it. I'm like, no, they messed up. That couldn't be me, <laughs> you know? And then the other people that were so sure of themselves, some of them didn't even make the list at all. And some were like in the hundreds or something, or it's, or it's like I joke around, they were number five of page 20, you know, it was like, you know, it, and then sometimes we really have to look at that and 
not just encourage others, but encourage ourselves and try to remember that we need to get out there. We need to try things. So what if you fail? If you don't try at all, you already failed, right? So you need to let that voice in your head say, it doesn't matter. I'm going to try. If I failed, at least I experienced it and I can do it again and, and I hopefully do better. And if I don't do it, I'm going to fail anyway, right? But that is hard. That voice inside of us is really hard. And I think, Christian, you're right. I think it's very female. I have three daughters and my daughters, one of my daughters works in construction and she tells me all the time, she's like, mom, I, I have no business being in this. You know, I'm all around the big barley men and, and I'm trying to tell them what to do. And I'm like, you absolutely have every business doing what you're doing. You're doing an exceptional job. You know, don't give up on yourself. But it is unfortunately a, a female kind of a personality thing. We need to get that out of our system somehow and help others do it as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to probably be a little bit of the black sheep here, um, you know, keep in mind a, a deputy chief called me cocky. Um, but I mean, you're looking at somebody who threatened to join the tackle football team in, you know, 1986 in high school. So um, I, I, I am an individual who takes pride in the fact that I, I have a history of being, shall we say, unfettered by convention. Um, and there are, and, and to, to, the point that a couple have already stated, you know, I, a lot of my motivation, if I were a police officer too right now, which is just an off probation police officer working the street, not even a field training officer. If I were a, a P2 today, I would still be happy as a pig in mud. Uh, you know, I, I, I love police work. Um, so, you know, it, many of my pursuits professionally and my uh, pursuits of promotion were a direct result of working for somebody who I developed a complete lack of respect for. And with anger and frustration and discontent, I came to the conclusion I can do that job better than they can. Um, and that unfortunately uh, was a motivation in many ways uh, for me to take the test because I didn't want to work for them anymore because they were incompetent. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I have had moments, fleeting moments of, of uncertainty, but I don't think I've been, um, it hasn't been a primary issue for me. Um, I, I do say though, that I, I do see hesitancy in, in my subordinates at times. And I see it in people that I don't understand why, because I see a great amount of talent and potential and everything else. And so there, there are times when I find um, that I am kind of reaching out to them and pushing them into opportunities uh, to and, and kind of getting them to overcome that hesitancy or that lack of confidence, um, you know, for what I like I say, for what I see as an incredible potential. Um, and so that that mentoring and, and I do see that in in both genders, um, whether I notice it more because of implicit bias or um, out of a, you know, a, a search to find and highlight and, and bring up women. Um, you know, I, I, I think I do see that hesitancy a little bit more in in the female gender amongst our ranks than I do uh, amongst the males. Um, but I see it amongst the men too. Um, so. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with mentorship throughout your career and what you think successful mentoring looks like? Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start with this one. As I mentioned earlier, you know, I've had mentors and tour mentors and, uh, you know, I, I really lacked female mentors and, you know, it's, kind of been brought up earlier, but I found a lot of um, the, as was aforementioned about women in law enforcement that were not willing to help. I have lost count of how many uh, female chiefs, like if I, when I was a young sergeant that I cold called, reached out to, you know, dropped an email, you know, hi, I'm, I'm a sergeant. I have aspirations of moving up and only to have those calls unanswered. And I remember thinking I will never do that to uh, a female or otherwise, anyone who asks for help. So I, I was let down a lot and then enter formal mentoring uh, roles. 
And I probably have a different opinion on formal mentoring programs than, than maybe others do um, in this conversation, but um, I don't particularly care for them. I was, I joined NOLI, you know, the National Association of Women Law Enforcement Executives, and they had a formal mentoring program and I wanted to be a mentee. And uh, I, you know, you placed your interest, you know, uh, in, in, in getting a mentor, they paired someone up with you. And I found that that just didn't work. And what I've learned over the years is that mentoring is organic. It's just like, you know, falling in love. It's just like falling in friendship. You know, it's like, you know, we have a connection and then we pursue that connection and then that connection evolves organically. But when you force two people and go, you are henceforth the protege and you are the mentor, it has not once worked in my life. And so I, I'm kind of against that. So I did not do that in my police department. Um, so I will say that, you know, <laughs> that I have had, I'm going to give two ends of the spectrum here and then, I, and then I'll move on, but, um, let's talk instead about male mentors, let's talk about females and, um, man, they're the, the females that, that I did develop that organic relationship with, uh, are still mentors to this day and they are advocates. And so to me, that is what a mentor is not just someone that you call up and say, woe is me, but this is someone that picks up the phone calls someone else and says, Hey, you, do you, you know, you know, Brenda, you know, Shannon, you need to take a look at them because, you know, they, they need to be put in this position. So they're not just, you know, your personal therapist. These are people that are, are going to put action behind it, you know? And, and so, and I mentioned that early on in my career, but I will tell you something, saboteurs are alive and well. And, and, and so uh, again, such great, great mentorship. And I'll give two names, uh, Sylvia Moyer and Cynthia Renat Renault from California, two police chiefs that um, that truly are mentors to me and 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 they came up with this concept called save a seat for a sister. So whenever uh, we're at a chief's conference, it doesn't matter if you don't you don't know, you put your your bag down on your chair and then you wait for a female to come in and you wave them over even if you don't know them and you save a seat for a sister. So so I've been the benefactor of that which I think is just amazing and warm and fuzzy. But then let me give you the other aspect. And this just happened to me. I, I pursued uh, the Chicago superintendent's job um, in, uh, in November of, of, of 2020, of 19. And I, I made it to the final three for the Chicago superintendent. And then they, our names went public. So I'm sitting in my final interview with the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot. And she has this giant file because they've done a background search and or a background check. And she opens this file and she says, now, now remember, this is circa uh, 2020, almost 2020. And she says, were you at a conference in 2012 uh, in Dallas, a female police conference? And I said, yeah, I said I was actually uh, a board member of NOLI at the time. And she said, well, um, you know, someone came forward um, and said that you were dancing provocatively at a bar after hours at, the, at a meeting. And I literally, I was dumbfounded. I said, dancing provocatively? I said, maybe dancing terribly, but provocatively, I'm not so sure. You know, I said, but hey, maybe I'll, all right, I'll own that. I'd had a couple margaritas. It was after hours, you know, I'm with all women, female police. Like, I feel like you can kind of let your hair down. So someone had the wherewithal to reach out to this background, you know, committee and I found out who it was and it was someone in Nolly with me. And she was, and you know what the sad part is, she was one of the very first um, to break the brass ceiling at LAPD. And 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 I, I found out who it was, they pulled me aside and said, yeah, not for nothing, here's who it was. And I thought to myself, this was, you know, how, how, how many years ago, you know, eight years ago, and she thought it, that she should come forward. And, and I thought, man, the, all the progress that we have made. And then here I am being sabotaged. And I will tell you, when I brought this up to all the guys at work, they're like, okay, man, like guys can be the worst, right? But I'm telling you, there's no guy in the world that will ever pick up the phone and say, hey, listen, Barry was uh, went to a strip club uh, at the conference. You know, I'm like, exactly. So, you know, and I'm, I know that's not why I didn't get the job. They gave it to someone who was uh, far more experienced, but I thought, man, and just the idea, you know, to go out of your way to sabotage another woman um, for, for what reason? So I am fully, you know, I'm, I'm, 
conscious that there are still people out there, but, you know, I don't know if that's just, you know, women and being catty, but I thought that we were done with that, you know, so I will shut up and let someone else comment. Yeah, Kristen, to your point, I, I think, um, you know, there, there are that, that whole forced mentoring rather than allowing it to be organic. Um, I think even on top of that, mentoring has become almost politicized. Um, there are, I, I truly believe uh, that there are people who engage in mentoring and development efforts because they believe it's a box they need to check for their next level of promotion. So they want their name to be on a promotion seminar or an interview prep seminar. Um, and they, they aren't really passionate about it. Um, you know, and, and so I think that is, has become an issue. I, I think also there are those, you know, we in the LAPD have adjutants, um, and I look on, on adjutants very similar to my experience in the military with aid to camps. Um, and so uh, from the captain level and above, you generally have an adjutant, a, a right-hand person. It's usually what it's supposed to be in my mind and what I had the benefit of experiencing as a young sergeant was uh, you, you generally pick, you know, a captain will pick a sergeant from amongst their patrol squads that seems um, talented, passionate, dedicated, has a lot of potential and they choose them as their adjutant to because a it's a position of trust it it takes a lot of hard work a lot of flexibility but in return for asking them to work harder probably than they ever have in their career thus far you are exposing them to a level you know of department operations of decision making of risk management you know uh, that they will not find anywhere else. So it it, it is a you know a, a certain symbiotic relationship. Um, it is a fantastic opportunity if it is approached right by both people. Um, I, I a lot of people don't. Uh, I think a lot of people in command positions either aren't aware of that, um, don't educate themselves to that, don't use it in that fashion. They they use it as a um, almost a glorified secretary position. Um, or on the other hand, they use, they work those poor adjutants or people like a dog and never afford them those, that, that, that opportunity. They, they don't, you know, when, when I, the way I've used it and how I was taught, uh, again, as a young sergeant by my first and, and greatest mentor in this department, uh, another female, um, was, you know, I was essentially, you know, one step behind her on her right shoulder everywhere she went. Um, I was the fly on the wall in, in meetings that no other sergeant would have been exposed to. Um, you know, and obviously I was like the child in the room. I was expected to, you know, be seen and not heard in many respects, but that exposure to the way people above me thought and made decisions and, you know, those considerations that they had to have at that 30,000 foot level um, was amazing to me, you know, and as a as a politically incorrect sergeant at the time, a very outspoken sergeant, a sergeant who said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life as a sergeant because I'm not going to play the political games and machinations that it takes, you know, or kiss anybody's butt to to move above this rank, because that was my perception at the time. Um, you know, that, you know, she sat down with me and said, I see great potential in you, but we need to, and this was her quote, no kidding. We need to round out your round down your rough edges. Um, and, and she accepted that challenge and I've been grateful, uh, ever since then. Um, you know, but it's, it, they, there, there has to be the proper approach, you know, not, not everybody, I think, has it cut out to be a mentor, if, or at least if they don't put the energy into it. You know, it's not just, you know, the mentee asking questions and getting answers. Um, you know, so it, it, it's you have to have a certain level of passion to be a mentor. You truly have to believe in what you're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it, it's I, I've seen, I've seen both sides of that.
I have to agree with both of you. Um, those official mentoring programs that I think departments try to put into place uh, never work. Um, first of all, it's hard to get people that want to join them. And I think it's even harder that, uh, unless they have a checkoff box that they have to do that want to be a part of it as a mentor. It has to come naturally. And, and for me, I mean, unlike you guys, I really was very lucky that I had a mentor uh, that really helped me. And it, it, the way it happened was naturally. Basically, I was a sergeant and I was doing extremely well as a sergeant, but I started to take some time off that was not normal for me, right? And this major actually noticed that my one of my daughters uh, had some health issues. She had to have surgery. Uh, it was, you know, it's a long story. However, luckily, she's perfectly fine now. But it was a few months that, months that were very scary, and there was a lot of doctor's appointments and a lot of uh, things that had to be handled. So she just happened to notice that she was one of those hands-on majors that really got to know her people. She called me up into her office. I'm like, oh, my God, I had never really, other than say good morning, ma'am, you know, good afternoon, ma'am. I had never had a conversation with her. Uh, but she calls me up to her office. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what the hell did I do now? I'm sorry. What the heck did I do now? <laughs> so she brings me up. She goes, man, man you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about you because you've always been like very good at attendance and, and I haven't seen you take, you've been taking a lot of time off. Is everything okay? So she took an approach as other than discipline of asking me. And I basically, you know, I guess because she was a female and it was a kind of a positive sort of thing for me that she was asking me. I was like in tears, which of course, like you said, in Chris, Kristen, there's no tears in police work, right? <laughs> But in this case, she was, look, I feel so sorry. I'm so sorry. I've taken too, so much time off. And I explained to her what happened. And from that moment on, it was like we clicked. And she uh, not only was very attentive to my needs as, as a mom for my child, uh, my family, but also my career, uh, because she knew that I was like really working hard regardless of what was happening in my situation in my personal life. So she really kind of took it upon herself to build me up. And to me... That's what mentoring looks like. It's really getting to another person, a, nat a natural connection, relationship with that person. And then since then, in my career, everything that I thought that I wanted to do or any assignment that I wanted to interview for or any test that I wanted to take for promotion, before I did anything, I would reach out to her and she would give me the good, the bad, and the ugly, which is a good thing, I think, of a natural mentor, too. They don't just, like, a, I think, an artificial mentor Basically, it's like, oh, well, do A, B, C, and D. It's kind of like, you know, just give you a guideline. She would tell me, listen, this is what you're going to be looking for. This is what you're going to experience. You know, just know that, you know, you're starting all of a sudden, you know, you have no seniority. You're going to be working shift work again because you're starting as a brand new lieutenant or whatever. So she would give me the good and bad and the ugly so that I could make that decision based on that. Uh, and that to me was an amazing uh, experience. And I tried to do that for other women and men in the department. And, and I and I thank God that I've had the opportunity to help others and that she kind of gave me that, wow, that's who I want to be like. That's who I, who I want to look like as a mentor. And I was able to use that to help others as well. I'll just turn in here real quick. I love what Oprah says about mentoring. I mentor something when I, I, I mentor someone when I see them and say, I want that to grow, right? And I think that that's that organic you know, connection that we were, you know, that you were talking about, you've got to have that organic connection. And I, I often tell people, you know, to, to encourage people to mentor, first of all, teach them what it is, uh, because good people will do uh, things when they know how to do it. And then secondly, encourage people to sponsor someone that does not look like them or advocate for them. Because it helps both ways because you learn the mentee and the mentor um, gain experiences and, and insight into each other. But it also turns that advocating into an automatic mentorship because to advocate for somebody, they have to be awesome. And for them to be awesome, you have to mentor them. So that's kind of the, the approach that I've taken with, with some folks in the past. Thank you to Brenda, Shannon, Maggie, and Kristen for coming on the podcast to share their knowledge with us today. Next week, we'll continue our conversation with Brenda, Shannon, Maggie, and Kristen about the challenges faced by women in law enforcement. If you have any questions or topic suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at podcast at ncbrt.lsu.edu.
Make sure you subscribe to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'll see you again next time.